Um, Hans Pfeiffer is our next speaker. We're going to be getting him set up as a panelist and uh, get him tied in here. Um, I'm looking forward to, to hear Hans's talk for a while because I have a soft spot for global forest data and wildfires and, and keeping track. Uh, we had some lovely wildfires here in British Columbia last summer. Um, big, uh, big chunk of the province burned down and uh, we got to enjoy some lovely smoke um, and small particles in our lungs. So, uh, so yeah, I want to hear about more about the global wildfire monitoring. Um, let's see, do we have uh, Hans turned on? There you are. Hi, Hans. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, hi Paul. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Oh, Looking thanks. forward for my presentation. Yeah, it's going to be great. So, uh, so are you a long time Postgres user? How, what was your story, your journey to, uh, to finding Postgres? Uh, uh, actually, I first uh, came uh, to post the GIS in 2002. Uh, a professor. I'm kind of uh, one of the first students in GIS in Austria. So he came up with the uh, post GIS and uh, he had uh -huh. little knowledge on it by that time. And so, yeah, it, it after this uh, presentation, it wasn't clear to me, but with time it grew and uh, I'm, a, I'm a user since, since then practically. Well, that's the that's the beginning. That's like a year after it came out. So you've been you've been around yeah. for the full journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why don't you fire up your uh, your slide deck and, yes. uh, and let's see. This looks like you got it going. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and all GS and database enthusiasts. Uh, welcome to my today's presentation on PostGIS in the Global Wildfire Information System. Um, first of all, let me thank you so much for having me here. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for giving us here the audience to present our uh, Global Wildfire Information System. Um, it was actually Paolo Corti, which uh, you most likely know very well. He's uh, the author of uh, PostGIS Cookbook, who started this journey uh, with the EFIS, the European Forest Fire Information System team here at the GRC. So yeah, uh, we're really grateful for his um, start here and uh, we're trying to fill his uh, footsteps. Um, yeah, also a uh, big thanks to, my, uh, to the whole GWIS uh, team, which I represent today here from the European Commission. Uh, we are the DG GRC in, in ISPRA. Um, yeah, uh, today, after a short introduction, uh, you will get an overview on the Global Wildfire Information System of the European Commission. Um, first, uh, yeah. I will introduce you to the system and all its features. Then I've prepared a use case, which is one of our automated processes that run in PostGIS. It is the filtering of the thermal anomalies in near real time. Then for all the PostGIS enthusiasts and maybe beginners, I have two lessons learned in dealing with the global data, not only wildfire, but the global data in general. So I always liked these PostGIS days where you learn little tricks. So I tried to give some of the lessons we have learned to the community. And finally, uh, challenges that we met or that we conquered and opportunities for the future. Uh, let me give you a short introduction to uh, myself. I'm uh, more than 20 years now in the GIS and natural resource management. Practically uh, all my professional life I've been in various uh, branches of geospatial technology. Maybe my, my main two encounters with the GIS uh, were when I was a one year at, the, at LSU in Louisiana. I worked there uh, 2003, 2004 for the FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency on evacuation plans for a hurricane event using LIDAR DEM data. And yeah, well, in 2004, it was just one year before Katharina. I asked my professor, 
uh, when such an event is likely to happen? And he said, yeah, most likely in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, we were doing evacuation plans. Uh, the US, uh, as compared to Europe, has very good data on where people live and, and the status of these people, where young mothers uh, live or where disabled people live. So it was very interesting for me. But uh, the likelihood of such an event happening in 20 or 30 years, um, yeah, uh, was not uh, enough for my motivation to, to keep on this path. So I was very surprised that just one year later, Katharina hit uh, New Orleans. And all of the work we have done there was uh, practically used on the spot. So yeah, what I learned from this is how important it is to be prepared for hazards to have the right data in the right place and how important it is to use this data wisely. So the next uh, encounter was uh, when then I moved to Sydney to do my uh, uh, thesis on uh, coral bleaching and the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, because of the coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef, um, um, dimensions. Uh, the Australian government wanted an, a new technology to evaluate uh, in a higher temporary re resolution the damages done to the Great Barrier Reef through coral bleaching. So we were analyzing hyperspectral data and remote sensing data in general. What our uh, study suggested back in 2004 5 were that by 2025, 70% of the Great Barrier Reef would be destroyed through coral bleaching. Even that was uh, very um, surprising for us. But uh, yeah, back then we got the, a lot of laughs, but uh, today we are proven right. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef is almost on the brink of, 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 full, uh, of, of being fully destroyed by coral bleaching. And, that showed me also the importance to monitor global events, to monitor climate change, to better understand the processes. And we can only do this through data. And I think geospatial data is at the core of this. Uh, partly for both project, I uh, already used uh, uh, PostGIS, but not entirely. So yeah, for me, these were like these key events where I uh, learned the importance and the power of GIS data. Uh, later, I joined uh, uh, Fugro in the Netherlands, which is a, 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 a big provider of uh, uh, survey equipment and survey services. And later uh, uh, went to Hexagon IP uh, the company that uh, bought Intergraph, which is probably known to uh, most of you. Yeah, since 2014, now I'm an independent GS consultant. And since 2019, I support uh, the European Commission with the uh, Global Wildfire Information System. Why map wildfires? Uh, wildfires are one of the global relevant hazards. They occur everywhere and they occur uh, constantly. Uh, fueled by uh, climate change, we see more and more fire events, but not only more in numbers and more in size, but also in different occurrences. We can really uh, see that uh, very well through the data we gather. Uh, another application is the risk analysis. We are also working on uh, uh, risk um, forecast and, and risk models. And uh, we bring all this data that we gather in the last 20 years, we bring into our risk models with, with other uh, global data sets. And what we can see on a global scale, especially in the last years, as Paul already uh, said in the introduction, uh, is that the wildfires uh, get more extreme. We saw that the fires on the West Coast, the fires in Russia and the Tiger, we saw the fires in Australia and uh, also in Brazil. Uh, in the last years, they showed uh, extreme and, and brute force. And uh, our work is to analyze why this happened and to in future better predict or uh, learn more about these uh, wildfires. Uh, 
it's not finally concluded by science, but we can expect that climate change with all its uh, effects will probably fuel uh, 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 wildfires. Yeah, why we use Postgres and uh, PostGIS at the GRC, I already mentioned Paolo Cotti started it in, uh, with the EFIS team already. It uh, is in line with the free and open software data approach of the European Commission, and it integrates very well with QGIS and other PostGIS that. For us, another big advantage is the integration of Python with all its uh, data science and data manipulation uh, uh, libraries and what we learned now with the with the COVID pandemia is uh, the great uh, possibilities with scalability and ABS uh, integration. So uh, let me move now to the global wildfire information system. What's behind? Mainly at the core uh, is we are. Um, getting from NASA our thermal anomalies uh, roughly four times a day on a global scale. And on this NRT uh, thermal anomalies, we calculate uh, burned areas. NASA roughly needs uh, one to two months to uh, calculate the burned areas and to um, clean and verify the thermal anomalies. So with NASA, you get uh, two products. You get the near real time, data and the process data. In order to show this data on a global uh, scale, we rely on uh, the near real-time thermal anomalies and build our own burned areas, which NASA doesn't. So for this, we have the current situation viewer, which you can see on our website. And for our statistic data, going back uh, 20 years, we have the country profiles. These are the two main uh, products uh, that con of that uh, GWIS consists. With the country profiles, you have 20 plus years reaching back to 2000 of global wildfire data and all its statistics with land cover and build up area. Uh, further, we have an open data and service hub. So you can download all of this data uh, from our website. Uh, what does this data uh, do. It fuels a lot of various expert systems like emission, soil, vegetation regeneration, danger forecast, and uh, more. You see this in the in the slide. So at the core, you we have the thermal anomalies, which are practically uh, gathered by NASA, uh, a, a reflectance of the middle infrared uh, uh, channel of the MODIS um, satellite. And uh, through these thermal anomalies, we calculate uh, on a daily basis uh, burned areas on a global scale. Um, this is now, when you go on our website, you will find uh, this uh, current situation viewer. You can see the current fit, uh, situation on uh, global wildfires. You, we have uh, certain data sets that you can uh, a load as a background. For example, we have the human settlement layer, which is a product of the European Commission too. We have the protected areas layer on a global base and the CCI land cover. This is all uh, layers that support our statistics and su support uh, the intelligence that we get from the thermal anomalies and the burned areas. Uh, as a backdrop, we have uh, switched from OpenStreetMap to MapTiler. And um, yeah, uh, feel free to, to visit the website. I think it is very intuitive. And uh, yeah, you are always welcome to check it out. Uh, as I said, it's uh, four times a day we update all the thermal anomalies on a global base and calculate the NRT uh, burned areas. So what is cheap with the numbers? We have one primary and two secondary uh, Postgres 12 servers running currently on, on AVS with uh, 250, 265 uh, GB RAM, Postgres 3. 
Our main table space currently holds 1.7 terabyte, uh, roughly um, one third consists of the raster data. Uh, it's 8,200 tables and 51 schemas and 90% uh, of all our daily processes are fully automated and uh, most of them run inside the uh, uh, database. Uh, one special thing uh, we do beyond the, the national uh, fire monitoring is that the GWIS is, is, is very good in working uh, cross uh, border analysis. For example, as, 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 as two examples, I can provide you with the Arctic uh, region monitoring and the BLA, which is the Brazilian legal Amazon, which spans over four South American countries. And the Arctic region uh, spans over, I think, eight or nine uh, countries that cut the Arctic circles. Yeah, we can automatically automate it to generate uh, reports on these regions, which is often not so easy if you combine the, the data of the single countries. And therefore, we can monitor critical events across countries. Yeah, what are the global benefits now of, of, of having this uh, global wildfire information system instead of having uh, regional uh, systems? First of all, it's, um, it's harmonized and up-to-date comparable data across the whole globe. So especially to uh, investigate on climate change effects, it's important that we can compare uh, all the data across uh, the globe. And it's uh, implementation on national, regional, global scale. Um, let me move now to one of the use cases, um, filtering of the hotspots. So as I said, we get the hotspots continuously uh, from NASA. We access the NASA firm server to, to download the latest NRT hotspots. Uh, hotspots are practically just heat reflections from the middle infrared uh, red, uh, wavelength. So practically these hotspots uh, show us where there is a heat in a, in a certain uh, signature. So that also includes volcano, industrial uh, complexes and oil and gas uh, infrastructure. So in order to have a clear picture on where wildfire is, we have to filter. And we decided to filter based on the maximum NDVI, a water mask, and the buildup area. First, we started with land cover data, but it's not as, especially on a global scale, it's, it, it has not the quality that is expected. Uh, the maximum NDVI works very well. The NDVI is the uh, normalized vegetation index, which means we get a clear picture on how much fuel or uh, chlorophyll is at a, a certain uh, area. So if there is no vegetation uh, within one year, we can expect that there is uh, nothing that can burn. The same with uh, permanent uh, water layers. So when there is a, a continuous water, we often get the hotspots from oil and gas infrastructure close to shore or offshore. So we have to filter out them. Uh, this filtering uh, works uh, exceptionally well. We detect roughly 12% of all the hotspots as uh, false positives, mainly industrial complex and oil and gas uh, installations. And uh, the nice thing is we keep uh, satellite images of each uh, filtered thermal anomaly. So over time you get uh, uh, actually uh, a database on industrial complexes around the world. Um, so let me finally move to uh, lessons learned. I prepared two examples for the, for the experts in post-GS. They will be uh, not so 
uh, surprised, but I think for all the ones started or or haven't worked on global data, I think is 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 really good insights. It, it's already everything is done uh, in in post GIS, uh, but you have to know that it is there. So uh, when we were working with the with the Arctic Circle, you have one specific. Uh, and that is that around the Arctic Circle, there are many, many small islands and small inlets. I think nowhere in the world is uh, this comparable. So you can see this really nice if you uh, take the shape of Canada, it's uh, as a multi-polygon, and then you, you, you count the polygons. And then you see Canada is made up of almost 25, uh, 25,000 polygons yeah. And you see the other countries, Russia, Norway, or Greenland, not as high as Canada, but they have a very high amount of uh, polygons as well. So if you imagine now you have uh, 20 years of, of hotspots, which are practically point data, or if you take the footprint, uh, small polygons, and you intersect with, with Canada, then the index just has uh, the, the boundary box of Canada and needs always to, to go inside um, and, and, and check with the, with this, with, with the whole shape. Yeah. So uh, PostGIS came up with a, with a really great solution that we have uh, used many times and was very helpful for this region and all the work we have done. It's the ST underscore subdivide. And practically, as you see here, what it does is you can uh, tell the function um, when you subdivide uh, a geometry on how many uh, vertices you want uh, the new geometries or the subdivisions uh, to be. So. The great advantage is that you then end up, instead of having uh, one uh, box for the whole of Canada, you end up with uh, very small uh, geometries. And then if you imagine then uh, on the left area, we have uh, one uh, thermal anomaly. It is, it is a lot faster to, uh, to identify if it's uh, inside Canada or it's not inside. Uh, Canada. Um, the, the second lesson learned I wanted to present is um, yeah, when you use uh, with when you work with uh, global data, you uh, will most likely work with uh, WGS84, which is the main, which is even used in, in PostGIS in the geography, geography uh, data type. But be aware that in WGS84, there is the edge of the world. So you can really drop on that edge. And um, yeah, if uh, we, we run into problems that uh, sometimes, uh, uh, when you uh, work on a global data, sometimes you don't have really the intelligence where the fires are. So we had fires in Tongo and, and the South Pacific. And then if uh, there is a chance that uh, one geometry crosses this line, then you get uh, this effect that uh, it, it will go in the, in, the, in the direction of the whole world. So you end up instead of what you want, it is, for example, here I did just the envelope of, of, of the line. Uh, and the first example would be how it would be correct to have a line uh, along the datum line. And then I envelope this, and then I would get this. But uh, if you um, cross this line, what happens is that it goes all around the world, and you end up uh, with, a, with a polygon that spans the whole world. So then if you try to cross this with uh, uh, for raster layers, uh, you will end up gathering a lot of data. So the nice and beautiful solution is ST underscore shift longitude. So I would really suggest 
uh, if you work on global data and there's a chance that your geometries are crossing this line, then uh, make sure that in all your processes you use uh, uh, this function where you just you, you just cast all your geometries and what what the function does it, it casts instead of have negative values you will have and you will end up having longitude values from zero to 360. Sorry, what are our main challenges and opportunities? Of course, the biggest challenge when you work on a global scale is to have a really good uh, data sets. We use uh, for our administrative boundaries, a garden for land cover CCI and the GHSL. So we are really happy to have this, but it's not, it's, it's a lot of times that you would have for a smaller regions, a lot better data. And of course, the quality suffers on a global scale, consistency. So often we lose data sets because they're discontinued or uh, also consistency between uh, data sets that um, sometimes the data provider completely changes the data model behind and this breaks all our processes uh, in, in the aftermath. Then for us, it's a, a really big challenge is uh, the documentation of the database, mainly due to the speed with which we work. So uh, it is really hard for us to keep up the documentation, maybe for, for developers, something that is, is, is not so the big fun of, of working uh, as a programmer or a developer. So yeah, I think this is one of the, of the great challenges to keep a good documentation for all the people working with the database. And then opportunities, uh, what we are working now is uh, rec recalculating large tables. So we often have to pull really large uh, data sets like uh, many years of, of thermal anomalies. What I didn't mention, you have uh, globally about 80,000 thermal anomalies each day coming in. So if you pull that for a couple of years, you end up with, with a lot of data and uh, continuous raster integration and their functionalities, which is really important as uh, it is a lot easier to work on, on raster data on a global scale. So then uh, uh, a, a really quick uh, last uh, example from Austria. We had here in Austria, we luckily we, we really randomly have uh, large fires in Austria. But now we had last month, a really large one. Large for Austria is 90 hectares. But the thing was that it was on a really steep terrain. Um, so I wondered that in, when you calculate in post GS, the, the, the area, we usually do it uh, using a geography data type. We cast to geography and then we get the sphere, which is a lot faster. So this uh, fire was uh, calculated on the sphere, it was uh, roughly 70 hectares, but then uh, we pulled out uh, the, 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 true, uh, the, the true area, including the slope, and we ended up uh, having 90 hectares, which was then uh, verified from the Austrian authorities. So for us, I think this is a, a, a challenge in the next uh, month. To, to integrate uh, uh, this area calculation in our models. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I would move to the questions. Thank, uh, thank you very much. You can reach me over uh, uh, my European email address or my uh, company email address. And I also put the FS and GWIS team in case you want to contact them or check out the system or the data sets. As I said, we have 20 years of data sets available for you. That's a lot of data. Uh, thank you very much, Hans, yeah. for, for bringing, the, bringing the story of the global wildfire system to us. Can you tell me like how big, how big is this database now? It's 1.7 terabytes. That's, that's quite a bit, and like number of records, like there's got to be a lot of little little fire polygons by now. Eight, uh, or, uh, 
as I said, uh, we have uh, roughly 80,000 thermal anomalies each day, and that would uh, count up to maybe. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, I can't tell you. How much. Okay, so, so many millions, many millions. A couple of millions all. per year, a couple of millions per year. Yeah. And who? Uh, what, what what kind of organizations consume this data? Like, are there organizations consuming it live and then doing things operationally based on the analysis and data flow that you guys have built? Yes, yes. For us, uh, the uh, European Commission, uh, other DGs, they are uh, constantly uh, consuming our data, building into models. Then the um, uh, FAO, the Agriculture Organization, the Federal agriculture organization. They are big uh, uh, consumers of our data. And uh, insurances are, are starting to, to connect and, 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 and work with this data. OK, I got a question in the channel here from John Provaznik. Um, really curious about adding slope to area calculations. Is this done in Postgres, PostGIS, and how? OK. Ah, okay, so uh, how it is done, uh, what you have to do is uh, for every, uh, obviously you need a digital elevation model first. So if you have this for the area, you take, um, you need to calculate the, the slope correction for each uh, um, raster pixel. And then when you calculate this for each raster pixel, then you can sum it up for your whole area. Mm -hmm. And then you can calculate one value as a slope correction and you have to apply this then for your uh, uh, area. It's not that trivial, but I think, uh, yeah, we, we just need to make it fast. We know how, we, how to do it, but mm -hmm. on this data, amounts of data, we have to make it a lot faster than it's now. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Hans, uh, for, for talking to us. If you wouldn't mind hanging out um, on the Zoom for, uh, for a few more minutes, if other people still have questions, um, sure. you know, they can ask you on the chat or put a question in the Q&A. Um, 